Support the Bartholomew Town Podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. On today's episode, I sit down with communications strategist Mike Rea. Mike Rea is well known to Rhode Islanders as the former director of communications for Governor Gina Raimondo. He has built an impressive resume as a government, political, media, and brand communication strategist. Mike recently announced that he was joining Nail, a boutique communications firm, and heading up a new PR wing of the outlet, based in Providence, Rhode Island. Our conversation touched on Mike's experience as a comm professional, changes in the media and public relations landscapes, Rhode Island economic development, plus some stories from the field. Enjoy new episodes of the Bartholomew Town podcast every Tuesday and Friday. Listen on your favorite app or visit BartholomewTown.com. It's where you'll find the dozens of conversations I've had with Rhode Island influencers like Congressman David Cicilline and Congressman Jim Langevin, Treasurer Seth Magaziner, WPRO's Matt Allen, Nicola Mazzo, Providence Councilwoman Kat Kerwin, Travis Escobar, NBC 10's R.J. Heim. It's all right there for you anytime at BartholomewTown.com. In other news, very excited to let you all know that I've been awarded a producer's grant for this year's PVD Fest coming up in June. It's Bartholomew Town Live in downtown Providence. It's going to be a live podcast featuring some of your favorite political, media, and artistic influencers, plus a variety show with some of your favorite Providence musical and performance artists. Bartholomew Town Live coming to PVD Fest this year. And special thanks to you, the listeners, for all of your support. Couldn't do it without you. All right, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with the one and only Mike Rea. All right, so we are here with Mike Rea, famous, Rhode Island famous at minimum, perhaps <laughs> beyond, for your association with our current governor, Gina Raimondo, on the uh, on the comm side. Um just got through an election season, so you had quite a presence, I would say, in the lexicon of of politics and beyond the last year or so. And yeah, my Twitter feed was certainly more busy back then than it is now. <laughs> it's interesting. It's like, what did you really love me for? You know what I mean? What were you really after here? <laughs> <laughs> but now with Nail, which you're basically starting up a new element of that in Providence is that totally. heading up a new pro- totally yeah so nail has been around for 20 years 21 years and is in my mind and, and other people's minds the best creative agency in Rhode Island um, and does everything from logo design to websites to strategic communication from a design perspective um, and a couple of months ago after leaving the governor's office I uh, sat down with the with the team that that ran the firm for all these years and said why don't we partner up and start a PR business to go alongside it. Um, and I'm now running a strategic consulting and, and public relations division for them um, with a, a hope of building a, a business and a practice that touches locally here in Rhode Island, but also spreads out and, and is able to provide solutions for executives and, and organizations that, that want to uh, drive a conversation um, in, in a way that they might not have the opportunity to right now. And it's important, an element of what, what you just said there to me it's important that it's not just a Rhode Island based project or brand uh you know you're looking to bring ideas basically start ideas in Rhode Island and take them globally and and when when ideas exist in the world people might be able to look back and go wow that came out of Providence totally and also the other way I think there's a a I'm, my family's committed to Rhode Island we're staying here we don't intend on on moving anytime soon so I want to be able to see what's out happening other places and be able to bring those ideas and bring that that kind of conversation that's happening in other markets to help organizations and to help businesses here in Rhode Island bring that so that we can really lean into celebrating everything that the state has to offer right now. Um, and I think for so long, there's been this kind of 
fear of the outside and that the world <laughs> stops at the Rhode Island border. And <laughs> yeah. there's so many great ideas. And, and I get particularly excited as I'm going around talking to people right now in, in this world that I'm in of things like the development that's happening in 195 and, and just even driving over here, just seeing all of this great loft space and, and stuff that's in the city that has this potential right now to jump ahead and, and be in a place where other cities, other innovative places that have the same kind of access to higher education and, and meds and eds to really make that leap that we haven't yet made. Um, and th to whatever extent I can play a small role in, in maybe bringing some of those ideas from outside as I'm talking to clients and, and organizations that I've had involvement with over my career um, to bring that and to, to share those ideas with people who are trying to make an in, in imprint and a difference in Rhode Island. I'm all game. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with that. You know, the idea that I wonder if it goes back to just puritanical pilgrim origins. You're you're fearful of the winter. You're fearful of, <laughs> of getting slaughtered by natives. You're just fearful of everything. And there's still an element of that here in the Northeast. It's not that Rhode Island are always walking around in eggshells. It's a bold place, and there are bold ideas here. Mm -hmm. But to take that next step forward, it's going to require a lot of. Um, uh, uh, the continuing of looking at ideas from the outside and applying them here. So you have to really understand both the outside market and the nuances and intricacies of Rhode Island. Totally. And I think there's a sense that Rhode Islanders have gone through some really tough times over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and they've got reason. Rhode I, I think Rhode Islanders and, and institutional leaders in Rhode Island have reason to be cautious or uh, – I don't think there's ever a reason to be cynical, but I can understand the cynicism because of decisions that were made in past years by past leaders because of the what we saw happen to the state after the, the factories closed and, and the jobs shipped overseas. that We didn't recover in a way that some of our neighboring communities did. Um, and there has always been, and, and maybe it's the puritanical roots, or maybe it's just this, these old ingrained New England colonial root, uh, roots where you are defined by where you're from. And being a Rhode Islander versus being from Massachusetts versus being from Connecticut for centuries has meant something, and it should still mean something. I think there is a, a there, there's a, a goodness that comes with that chip on a shoulder that Rhode Islanders have. And I think that it makes us gritty and makes us more competitive and makes us a, a, the, the, the underdog in a way that will have an advantage. But the other side of that coin can be this sense of we've done these things before and it didn't work. So I try again. And what I'm hopeful for right now, and, and again, as I drive around or as I see things happening now that I'm downtown and I'm just walking around down there, you see this, <clears throat> new sense of willingness to try something different because there's new generations of people. I mean, I, th I think when I first moved back up here eight years ago, seven years ago, um, I don't think you'd have two thirty somethings having a conversation like this right now um, right. <laughs> about what to feel good about with Rhode Island. Right, and right, that's right. changed a lot in that time. And we weren't around. We didn't get punched in the nose the way that our older siblings or, or some older generations have so that we don't have that same sense of um, fa – failure is not the right word. We don't have that same sense of, of demoralization that previous generations might have had. So we're willing to take those risks and, and we're willing to see that something might be able to come of doing something a little bit different or maybe doing something that – was done in the past that didn't work, but we've got different minds that are around the table right now. I agree. There's a nice intersection happening right now. You're a part of that. Uh, there's a lot of other people that I've been able to meet over the mm -hmm. last year, and it's been, I don't want to say surprising because that almost seems rude like you wouldn't expect mm -hmm. it, but I've been surprised by the amount of tw late 20s, 30s, early 40s mm -hmm. working on very specific projects to move the state forward, not just generally advocating for new ideas, but actually working on whether it's in public art or public transportation or healthcare, telemedicine, whatever it may be, there's actually people in our age group finally thinking about those things. And it seems like our leaders are finally listening a little bit. Totally. I actually think as I look back on kind of the time that I had in the governor's administration, I got to spend the first four, the first four years of her term working pretty closely with 
her, particularly when I was in the state house, but with the rest of her team, she brought a group of people, most of whom are native Rhode Islanders or, or went to college and stayed here. Um, so I don't buy the criticism that it's a bunch of outsiders and a bunch of out of state people who came in, but she brought a new group of people to the table. And typically in politics, people stay in a job three years, four years at most, and, and go off and do something else. As people are leaving her office or have left her office over the last year, they've stayed in Rhode Island and they're making a contribution in some way or another. I started a business. I have a colleague uh, who left and, and did a great job at Blue Cross. One, your recent guest, Rebecca Weber, um, worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield and is now going to run CIC here. It's people who have a... And, so the governor's one of the governor's lasting legacies in in my eyes is going to be finding and building a new generation of people who want to give back and want to work and and live in this environment and contribute in whatever way they're able to, whether it's civically, whether it's as a business owner, whether it's as an employer. Um, I mean, maybe it's it's certain people from the office eventually running for office of some kind. Um, and we haven't seen that kind of new generation come in really since Bruce Sunland was governor, where he brought a group of 20, 30, 40 somethings who and gave them the opportunity to reshape and rethink the way that Rhode Island government worked and the way that Rhode Island government intersected with business and civic organizations. And some of those people are still around the table making incredible contributions. Some guy named Senator Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, (laughs) David Cruz, Frank McMahon. These are all uh, Barbara Cottom, people who are making incredible, incredible contributions and have been for 25 years. And my hope is that the, the the Gina Raimondo alumni network is able to have the same kind of imprint that the Bruce Sundland uh, alumni network has had. Yeah, that's a what an analogy as well. Bruce Sundland is someone I had him as a professor at URI, and uh, oh, so wow. I got to know him a little mm-hmm. bit. And it was a Rhode Island history class, so we weren't talking about too much Rhode Island political juice. Mm-hmm. You know, I did get him a few times at the library or whatever. But in recent times, just looking back on that guy's story, you know. The backstory of whatever was boxing Nazis, oh, you know, yeah. after his it's, plane uh, crashed. So David you know. David Preston has one of the greatest stories in the world about a raccoon. You should have him on this show. I, I won't do it any justice, but have David come on and tell you the story of of, of Sunlin and the raccoon. It's noted, <laughs> um, but it's it's. I mean, he had an incredible legacy. We wouldn't have the airport if not for him. And yep. the the economic development things that are happening in the city right now are the or in in the state are the fruit of some of those investments. And without TF Green, there's no way that Governor Raimondo would be able to sit down at a table with anyone from Cambridge, Massachusetts or or New York and pitch the idea of Rhode Island being an innovation hub for the Northeast because there'd be no way to get here. Right. Um, but the and as that airport expands and as, as more and more direct flights are going out, it also means more and more are coming in. And we're seeing it. I'm seeing it down again downtown in the two, three months that I've been working down there again. There's so much activity around the Providence Journal building because of Virgin Pulse and because of Infosys in there. And it's cars coming in and out. It's people coming in and out. And it's you can tell it's people with suitcases that you know they're jumping in Uber and they're going to TF Green to go back to Atlanta or Charlotte or wherever it is that they came in here from for a day of business. And that's good. That's, That's great. It's it's we yeah. we want to see more of that. I want oh, yeah. I, I I want it to take more than fifteen minutes to get to the airport because it means that there are more people on the roads driving to the airport to and from doing business here. Right. Let's uh let's kind of bridge that into the new train station mm-hmm. in Central Falls. Just just a general thought process on there's actually kind of a Twitter thread going on right now that that I'm involved in. I don't even remember Got who started. Oh, I've talk, seen that yet. Talking about uh, discussing. Um, Rhode Island's relationship to Boston mm-hmm. is inferior to Western Connecticut's relationship to New York City. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I would agree with that in some ways, having experienced both of those. Um, regardless of that, though, the, MB, the, the, the MBTA versus Metro North, the Metro North is, in my experience, you know, a lot easier. It's a lot easier to move outside of the city. Let's totally. put it that way. But if, if this Central Falls station opens up, do you see a pipeline 
opens up and is effective? Do you feel like it, there's a pipeline that could be connected there between Boston and and Providence? Oh, finally, yeah. and a, a, a peaceful one for people. I think so. It's it's massively expensive, <clears throat> and I don't have the answers as to what money sh- money tree to shake to be able to to make the investment to have that kind of frequency. That you really, because that's what it ultimately comes down to. I lived yep. in Boston for a while, and I when I first started working up there, we were still living here. Um, and we moved up there because it was so difficult to get there, but it wasn't impossible. If you can work near South Station or if you work downtown, doing the train isn't all that difficult as long as your hours are consistent. But what ha- what I've done and when I'm going up right now and, and having meetings up there, if you miss the 530 train, you're kind of SOL yeah. until the next one comes and there's not that consistent or if something pops up, you're kind of stuck up there. Um, so we need to find, and, and I know this has always been something that uh, a lot of, of ink has been written or a lot of ink has been spilled on it and a lot of people have had conversations about it. I don't know where the administration is in terms of a conversation uh, about it with Massachusetts because it is a two-state solution if it's going to be done. Um we need more frequency. We need faster trains. We need the federal government to pony up and to make the kind of investment in public infrastructure and public transportation to be able to connect these hubs. Um, but I do see a really big appetite for people who even work in Boston moving down here because of the cost of living. Sure. Um, one of the biggest reasons that my wife and I moved our family back here after being up in the Boston area for a couple of years was we started to look at houses. We loved this one uh, neighborhood in Melrose, Mass. It was a great uh, community, really similar to the Summit neighborhood on the east side, uh, which is where we live now. We looked at one house that was over $700,000, and it needed a new kitchen, it needed new plumbing, and the deck was going to be condemned. We came here, and we found a house for half of that that was move-in ready, and we're able to walk to everything that we want. We have neighbors with kids the same age as ours all around the corners, and I can get to the office in eight minutes from there. So there's a – I think there's a big appeal for Rhode Island to be a bedroom community to Boston, Um, but I also think that it's a great market for – some of the startups and some of the the innovative companies in Boston that are growing, but they're not quite growing into the billion dollar firms. They're growing into the hundred million dollar firms, which sounds like a ton of money, but there's a lot of overhead with some of those. There's a lot of investment that they need to put in there. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper to be able to set up shop in one of the downtown Providence facilities and one of the downtown Providence office buildings than it would be to find space in Cambridge or in Boston or even now in Brighton or Alston. Yeah, I, that's that's the pathway forward. That's at least part of the economic development salad, so to speak, mm-hmm. that we have to look yep. to. What do you think are some of the major industries, you know, from from your perspective in the in the communications arena, um, whether it's specific or broad, you know, where where are we heading in in terms of who we should be attracting and, and how we should be building the workforce of the future? I mean, I think, in, and certainly when I was in the governor's office, these are things that we would lean into. Uh, medical device, the uh, advanced engineering, advanced manufacturing. We have such an incredible history of being the manufacturing hub of the East Coast. And I think that's still in people's bones and in their blood. They want to make, Rhode Islanders like to make things and we're not going to make the widgets or the, the, the jewelry in the way that we used to, but we can make the precision pieces of certain medical devices because we've got really great engineers coming out of Brown. We've got really incredible design students coming out of RISD. We've got access to the Boston market and some of their medical companies that I think that's one area that you're going to see a lot. I think that with the uh, incredible hospitals that we have here um, and uh, and with the uh, being one of the very few places in the country that has an Ivy League medical school. Um, there's a ton of opportunity for healthcare to continue to be a big part of our economy. And I think that there's a lot of innovation in healthcare that can come out of the cross section of medicine, policy, um, and even folks like me in, in kind of the communications world of 
talking with people about what their health is, what their benefits are, how they can navigate a system. Um, and another interesting place it, that I don't think gets as much conversation um, and there's a handful of, of organizations and, and people that are paying attention to it is um, the the aging community. There's a, an entire generation of people who are want to age with interests and age with dignity and maybe retired but have other roles to play or other things to contribute. Um, they're a huge part of our population in Rhode Island, we're one of the oldest states in the country. Um, and we can tap into the the wisdom and, and the, the time that older Rhode Islanders have, but I think we can also build an economy around the services that we're able to provide and, and the uh, innovations that we can offer to help people navigate their retirement, their end of life care, their, uh, their palliative care. That's fascinating. That's the first time I've, I've heard that and it's such a it's somewhat obvious thought, but at the same time, I think the definition of aging and retiring is evolving. You know, like my mom's retired. She plays pickleball now. Yeah. She's involved in tournaments. And there's an industry around pickleball mm -hmm. from equipment through organizing, you know, ch traveling tournaments, whatever it is, you know, that, totally. that's, that's fascinating. Yep. And that's what it's, it's funny. You're the, the third person that's mentioned pickleball in the last <laughs> week. Um, it's not, and it's not just the retirees who are playing. I know a yeah, handful of my, of, of my, my friends who are in pickleball leagues through the Y or through the JCC. It's the new disc golf here <laughs> or dodgeball. Yeah, exactly. Kickball, whatever it is. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. You're right. The, I, I kind of sensed, I didn't know that statistic off the top of my head that Rhode Island's one of the oldest states, but you can sense that that's a really good thing. In a lot of senses, you have access to world war II veterans decreasing mm -hmm. and, and decreasing or, or any number of people from the old school mm -hmm. way of doing things. I imagine their lives in black and white, you yeah. know, you kind of have this vision of it, but, um, we we some we we can't just cut off and and say oh, we've got the new economies and we're gonna forget about that generation mm -hmm. for for the reasons. Yeah. That you're but it's describing. also but that those new economies, particularly with some of the areas where we do have expertise in Rhode Island, can benefit that that population and and benefit yep. those Rhode Islanders. Um, and it's frankly, it's something that I think we need to do a better job of because it's such a big bu budget buster when you look at the state budget. The the Medicaid is now taking up in the neighborhood of about anywhere from a third to a quarter of the state budget. Um, and it's because people are living longer, because we are covering more, because the state is covering more people. Um, but as we move into a world where more people are covered and people are living longer, we, we, as a state, as a, a nation probably too, need to be able to provide and, and make investments in quality of care uh, rather than a fee-for-service or a, a pay-as-you-go type model. That the, the incentive should be there to make sure that people of all ages, but particularly as people age, are able to live a healthy life at home because it's a lot cheaper to provide care. It's a lot cheaper to prevent illness. Um, and it's a lot cheaper to get people healthy and then keep them healthy, uh, than it is just to respond to whatever's right in front of them. All right. Plus it's a lot better for society, exactly. and humanity yeah. in every sense. So it, it does seem that we're, we're zeroing in on that, that arena, if you will, apolitically, we're mm -hmm. just starting to think about efficiency oh, yeah. and just having a better world. Yep. You know, those I mean, are factors. I think, I think people on all sides of the aisle are interested in making sure that we're able to provide quality care to people at lower costs. And there's a there's a lot of conversation and, and discussion that's happening about how exactly to to do that and, and how much of it because you want to be able to do it in a way and, and provide care in a way that makes sure that it's still business friendly in the state, that it's still predictable for, for businesses. Um, and I, I think that's something that is a, a conversation that we need to continue to have in any kind of public forum that we can find. Totally agree. Um, speaking of, or speaking to communications and some of your mm -hmm. work, past, present, future, how does communications tie in to the lives of everyday Rhode Islanders, other than the obvious, which is that you're getting information that's either you should hear for, for your own benefit mm -hmm. uh, or need to for, for the sake of civility or, uh, you know, just 
puff pieces that we we have to kind of sift yeah. through. What's that like? So I think right now we're in a really interesting time because there's so much content that's out there. There's so many platforms for people to consume content. And we're talking on a podcast right now. People who are listening to it are probably scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter as they're listening to us. Um, there's the nightly news. There's still the newspapers. There's all of these different facets of where people are getting hit with content. And it's more difficult than it's ever been before to get a broad message to a broad audience because they're so fractured and because they're they're curating their own content on who they follow on Facebook and what groups they're in on Twitter. Um, so I think the profession of communications is more important than it's ever been, but it doesn't diminish the equally important, if not more important role that an independent press plays. Um, the reporters that I've worked with throughout my career, and I've worked in four different markets, also have a much more challenging job right now than they've ever had. They are facing budget cuts in their newsrooms. They're parts of smaller newsrooms. They're being asked by their editors and by their publishers to write, to edit, to tweet, to post, to have a their own personal brand. And it takes away from the opportunity for them to really be ingrained in the community, which I think most reporters that I've talked to would much prefer. I think they would gladly lose the uh, having to be a jack of all trades in, in all platforms and be able to be a hard-nosed reporter, uh, ask the right questions, work the right sources, spend the time that they should, that they want to spend on a story. Um, and I think that we need to work, that reporters and, and, and flax need to work together and, and come to the realization that both parties' jobs are vital, that both parties' jobs are more difficult than they've been in past years and past generations, um, and that the each and every person in a communications, with a communications responsibility, should understand what those platforms are out there right now. Um, and that's where I think like people like me or and, from when I was in the government and now that I'm in, in kind of work, uh, now that I'm working with an agency or building an agency, what our roles are is to help people share their message and get their message out. 60% of my life when I was in the governor's office was kind of on a, all right, what are we going to try to do proactively? What do we want to push out? What do we, uh, what story do we want to tell? Of that 60% though, 80% of that was stuff that we felt that we had a public service obligation to share. The governor ran for office on a platform with an agenda, and she needed to communicate what that agenda was because she wants to, in her two years or her two terms in office, leave Rhode Island better than she found it. Um, so, yes, we pushed press releases. We pushed our own messaging. We would, for lack of any other word, would spin um, and tell a, the the positive story that we wanted to tell, but it was with a, it was a means to an end. And the end is building public support for the set of policies that the governor and our administration believed were going to, to move the state forward. Um, now that I'm working in a, a firm-based agency and, and the, the folks that I'm working with by and large are organizations and, and groups and, and, and businesses that want to do more than just sell a widget. Um, they want to be able to tell their story. They want to, and, and people expect brands to be like that now, by the way, they, they want, I, I'm a big outdoors guy. I consider Patagonia a friend as much as I do <laughs> the, the retailer that sells me my camping stuff. Um, but there's a conversation that people in my role can help facilitate and you're never in total control of it. You never should be in total control of it because then it's not authentic. But what we're able to do and where I think communications professionals have a vital role to play is helping leaders, helping businesses, helping organizations find their voice in a really, really, really noisy environment. Yeah, it's and it's noisier than ever, as you say. And there's an intersection of media now that I actually brought up a few hours ago with Alan Rosenberg, so the listeners will have heard me say mm -hmm. the same thing on Friday. This is going to air next Tuesday. But an intersection of 
entertainment, commercial, and news media that sometimes that, that that today can get blurred in a way that I don't remember experiencing before. You no, know? it's totally like that. It's a people are watching cable news not to be informed necessarily, but to be entertained or to be validated that their opinion or their worldview is right. And there's a role for cable news, and and I think that. There is a 24-hour news cycle, but at the same time, the 24-hour news cycle didn't really exist before CNN. Um, and there's a lot of time to fill when you have that much airwaves and when you've got five cable news broadcasts and everyone's got a got TweetDeck on their computer. Um, and I think that's where what you're seeing with gatehouse, not just here in, in Rhode Island, but across all of their um, entities and, and any of the other you know, old, older, uh, traditional and, and established newspapers that are, are kind of being downsized or, or being under budgeted. What we're really losing in that is reporters and editors who are able to take that time to... You know, how a story fits in within a broader conversation um, and with, or within broader events that are happening. And they still, the Providence Journal plays an incredibly, incredibly important role um, by allowing that kind of meditation on something before they hit publish. And I think that the, the physical paper that arrives every morning before seven o'clock is an important balance in the world where Twitter can too often drive a narrative. Um, I'm particularly excited that the Boston Globe seems to be wanting to come into Rhode Island too, because I think competition is good for everybody. And they hired an incredible journalist in Dan McGowan. Um, So I think that that's going to hopefully get everybody's competitive juices flowing and make everybody want to compete more, not just to be first, but to be right and to be the most thorough and to get the best second day story or third day story. Um, and I'm, I'm not ready to, to be one of those people who start writing the obituaries of local news. I think it's going to look a heck of a lot different in the next two years, let alone two decades than it does right now. And then it did 10 years ago. Um, but As long as there are curious people who live and breathe the community that they're working in, there's going to be good local journalism. It just might not look like it's coming in a Providence Journal bag in the way that it did 15 years ago. Um, But I'm I'm very certain that the Providence Journal will have a voice in that world in, in that environment for as long as I'm around it. Yeah, all the legacy platforms, you know, even the WPROs of this world. Mm -hmm will evolve. It will probably become more digitized and podcast oriented, Mm -hmm. but it'll exist. People will want that local, live local activity. And I think the the television brands, it's been interesting to monitor them, especially with the the, uh, interesting, uh, to say the least, um, ratings that just came Mm -hmm. out, which in one category shows 12 has finally caught 10 and then in the traditional category that we always usually look to that's not the case but Mm -hmm. but in any case it does look like 12 making some kind of moves by with the mcgowan with the nisi with the new way of thinking well it's lies damn lies and statistics (laughs) (laughs) so it's it's but it is interesting and i think that they've all got a a place where they've been able to define themselves and i i think that certainly Everyone's competing for the political story, and I think each of the outlets does a great job in their own way in those environments. But then you look at you know, where they want to make that second thread and what that second vertical is. And I'm really interested, in, and just as a kind of casual news observer and, and someone really interested in what Rhode Island's innovative and new economy is going to look like, I want to see who's going to really step into that space. I think Providence Business News is doing some of the best business reporting in the market right now. They're putting the resources into it. They're a, a half a step ahead, if not more, on kind of what's happening in the 195 land. Um, and I think that they they're, they write for a focused audience, but they've got real broad appeal. Um, and there's something every single Friday morning, I spend 45 minutes at my desk reading every single word that Mark Murphy puts out. I wonder if the access, um, you know, the economic 
restrictions that are associated with the Providence Business News. I wonder if there's a way to if if that can be delivered for free, mm. you know, and not for free, but in a way that's 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 similar to how you get your pro job, yeah. you get ten free clicks or whatever it is, yeah, just to enter people's minds. But it's a, it's a tough market, and it's, it's one of those. I think one of the the most damaging things to local journalism over the years has been that people, no one figured out a paywall early on. And for almost a decade, people have gotten used to news for free. Um, and it's not free to produce news. No way. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, it's a – and I mean I'm interested in you know, this thing that Apple rolled out earlier this week where – for a annual or a monthly subscription, you get access to a bunch of different newspapers. I haven't dug deep, deep into it yet to see what it, the what it would be. I know with our Amazon Prime subscription, we're able to get at least a, a version of the Washington Post. Um, I think that there's innovative business models that can come about and that there are in innovative partnerships. But for something like PBN, I know that's it's not cheap to be able to put that out because there it is a it's a paper version. It's they've got a great website, um, but I I uh, I really and, and part of this is because I spent two and a half three years working for WGBH in Boston. I think that there's a great model in public media for that can be followed and and that could be the potential future of what we think of in, in terms of local journalism. The Texas Tribune does that kind of um, print edition and digital edition, um, but they follow that subscriber model, um, paid or or, or um, nonprofit model to the way that they do news. Yeah, that is probably where things are heading, you know, or some version thereof anyway, user-generated media, whether it's in entertainment media or yep. in news media. Yep. No, and I think that there's, it's particularly with social media, anyone and everyone is able to be a journalist or is able to share content, make content, and distribute content. Um, but there's always going to be a really important role for credibility's sake of the, the what's that what's that brand? What's that masthead? What's that board of directors that's behind the words that are being put out, whether it's on a podcast or whether it's in, in printed word? And I think readers demand that. Um, they de they want to know, and, and there's a like, there there is a little bit of danger, I think, in some of the uh, social media and, and this push to have journalists being so engaged on social because Twitter's an incredibly imperfect medium, um, and you can misread the way that someone tweets something, you can misinterpret a retweet from a reporter, and those actions that reporters or editors might take or that you might see in one moment, but you miss the whole rest of the story around it can paint your understanding of their hard news coverage and can often make you read bias or, uh, it, or incompleteness into the work that they do that 10 years ago, that wasn't a challenge because you didn't know. And, and I think it's great. It's, I, I think it's awesome that the local reporters, personalities are known to their readers. It's it's interesting. It makes you feel more connected to it. But I think everybody needs to be really careful. Everybody in media and in communications needs to be really careful about what people see on those platforms. And, and I realize I'm the guy who literally tweeted Taylor Swift gifts at Alan Fung during a campaign. <laughs> so I know who right. I, I know my own role within that. But there's a I think that newsrooms across the country are still grappling with how they deal with social media and what their editorial rules and guidelines for their offices and what their newsroom should be uh, pertaining to that. And the, the, I think we've got still time to work that out. Um, but it's something that I really hope that particularly as the, the landscape changes that newsrooms have a, a very transparent and I, give Alan Rosenberg a ton of credit because he is so transparent with his readers um, and his Sunday column in, in the journal is a must read. And I think that this is a transparent conversation that newsroom should be having with their readers, with their listeners, with their viewers, um, so that they understand what their journalists and what their editors are doing um, and to not read into or, or not have that, that uh, opportunity to read into something that might not be there.
Yeah. Lastly, anything coming up for you in, in this, a specific sense? No. So I'm enjoying the uh, new work sense of work life balance that I get to have with my kids uh, and my wife now that I, I'm I've moved on from from politics. Um, but it's a, I really feel excited about where. Rhode Island and where Providence is right now. And the the, the best example that, that I give and, and I think a personal anecdote about why I feel like we're where we are. Seven years ago when I was working at City Hall and was looking for new opportunities, I didn't even think about looking in Rhode Island. There was, I was looking in Boston, I was looking in New York, I was looking in DC. Moved up to Boston for two years, two and a half years, and when the governor won, uh, when the and uh, when it was clear that she was going to have a partner in, in Providence City Hall, um, we moved back, and I took the job in the governor's office midway through her term, and told her that uh, I've got two. I can give you two and a half years, or you need to find, help me find a divorce lawyer because I don't know if my wife is going to let me do more than that. Um, and I did. And I really enjoyed the opportunity I had with her and, and it was such a great learning opportunity. She opened so many doors. And when I started to look at what my next steps were going to be or where I wanted to work, I didn't even bother looking in any other place but Rhode Island um, because I knew that the state had come so far that the economy had improved so much and that there was so much future potential here that I didn't want to be anywhere else. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Great parting words right there. Mike Rea, thanks so much for your time. I can't wait to do more as uh, things develop on your end. Looking forward to seeing what Nail PR has in store for all of us. Awesome. We'll, we'll be well, hearing from you, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and, and thank you for having me on. This has been yeah, fun. And, and let's do it again. Absolutely. As always, thanks for joining in on the Bartholomew Town Podcast. That's all the time we have for this episode. But I'll be back on Friday with brand new content. Until then, I'm Bill Bartholomew. We'll talk soon.